the September meeting of the Colonial School Board of Education to order. I'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everyone. Uh, if we can, please, as many of you know, is uh, we lost a member of the colonial family in this past weekend, this Nikki Saunders. If we could, we'd like to have a moment of silence. Thank you. Ms. Saunders was a elementary teacher at Newcastle Elementary and had been a teacher in our district for 27 years. She'll be greatly missed. Keep her family and her co-workers in your thoughts. Okay, first order of business we have. Any additions or corrections to the board agenda? None. If there are none, do I hear a motion to accept the agenda as presented? Motion to approve the agenda as presented. Do I hear a second? Second. We move a second to approve the agenda as presented. Questions? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. The agenda is approved. Next order of business we have is the consent agenda. The consent agenda consists of uh, past board meeting minutes. Educated, uh, education items such as EPER, personnel, and any possible business items. Do I hear a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? Motion to approve the agenda, <coughs> the, uh, the agenda, consent agenda as presented. Do I hear a second? Second. Been approved by, been, motion's been made by Ms. Kennedy, a seconded by Mr. McGee. To approve the consent agenda as presented. Questions? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The consent agenda is approved. Next order of business we have is transportation contracts. Ms. Falcon? Uh, in front of you, you have um, information regarding the bus contracts for the year. Uh, it looks like it's a total of just under $5.2 million for both uh, colonial run uh, contracts and uh, our contractor run buses. I hear a motion to approve the, the bus contracts. Lucy Kennedy and I make a motion to approve the contracts for the transportation department. Do I hear a second? Bill McGee seconds. To move second to approve the bus contract as presented. Questions? Will this, if these payments uh, continue to take place if we were to have another shutdown? Um, at, this, at this point in time, uh, the budget office has given us indication that they are going to continue funding transportation contracts um, with certain stipulations. There's, there's not a fuel allowance unless the buses are actually running. Um, but they are giving the majority of the, the contracts um, are receiving state funding to allow the contractors to continue. There's a concern about their ability to stay in business if those payments were to cease. So um, as far as I know, as long as the, the state budget office has that arrangement with the contractors, um, we'll be processing the payments as directed. Okay, and I'm assuming that they'll cover all the funds if we would have a shutdown out of the CARES, CARES money? Uh, that has not been discussed. I do not know what the claim would be if um, if it extends beyond that. Can you try to find that out and report back to us next month? I certainly can, but answers are not easy to report back. <laughs> I understand. I understand. I've been trying can to. Can we add that to our list? <laughs> I just think we need to ask that question specifically so we can go from there. Any other questions? They're funding the contracts. Are the employees working? Uh, that is one of the stipulations oh, is that okay. to, in order to receive the funding, they, they must certify that they have not laid off any of their employees. Good. So they're, yeah. so they're paying them. Correct. Okay. Any further questions? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion is carried. Superintendent's report, Dr. Menser. Yeah, I'd like to take a quick minute to review, uh, give an update on our return to school. Uh, today was our first student day. I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but I want to recap from the 24th of August to the 3rd of September, our teachers, paraeducators, and administrators participated in eight days of engaging and valuable professional development that uh, focuses on focused on a range of topics from equity uh, to schoology applications to any of the things that teachers and staff need to, pro to support remote learning. Um, it was a chock full of learning uh, and uh, time was well spent. Um, during that time, we you know, emerged the theme or the mantra from the, for the start of the school year, we got this. You've probably seen that all over the place. Uh, it's out on social media, it's on our website. I believe there's gonna be apparel being sold here shortly. I saw a teaser of what the, it's, the shirts look like. Uh, yeah. So Colonial is Gabe in- posted them. Right. Yeah, Gabe posted them out there. They look really sharp. Uh, and we're encouraging people to tell their story about how we got this in Colonial. Um, again, today was our first day for students. It was uh, students A through L last name their first day, tomorrow will be their second day, and then Thursday, Friday will be K through Z, uh, and then on Monday the 14th we'll have all students in. Um, we're really pushing the, the doing this staggered start It's going to allow those teachers to make better connections and establish those strong relationships with families, kind of to build towards the future uh, in, uh, in the remainder of the semester and the start of the school year. Uh, if you were following on again on our website or social media, you saw our meal delivery started today. Um, we, we, the waiver was approved for us to continue to provide meals to students and families uh, during this remote learning time uh, in the fall. Uh, it's a little different than it was in the spring and the summer. We are running now 40 uh, buses that are our transportation department is again partnering with our nutrition department to serve meals every day. Monday through Friday to our students. Um, they'll get a lunch and a breakfast uh, for the next morning that's uh, been prepared with love, as Mrs. Angelucci likes to say. I got to throw that in there for her. And this is, again, no cost to the families. Today, uh, 1,942 students received a nutritious breakfast and lunch. Total meals of 3,884 were served. Um, again, this couldn't happen without the collaboration of our nutrition department and our transportation professionals. Uh, real example of the power we and who we are. Um, and again, another example of we, we got this. Um, it's, it's challenging, but we do have it. Another uh, step we're taking to kind of gradually reopen is our offices in all schools in the district office. We started uh, opening them for limited hours for families specific uh, to help with registrations. Uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, the offices are open from 9 to 12, and Tuesday and Thursday, they are open 1 to 4. Um, we really are limiting the, the amount of folks into the building at this time, um, just to kind of maintain social distancing and kind of get acclimated to back having folks in the building, especially coming with that are some of the cleaning protocols we do when there's more than one or two people waiting in the areas that the schools have established. Um, we did go out and tour all the facilities. Uh, prior to that occurring, inspecting the entryways, the offices. Um, every office has a shield guard for their secretaries. There are stations for waiting. There's hand sanitizer and safety stations when you walk into every lobby of every building. Um, we are requiring that anybody who enters the building must be wearing a mask. Um, so that's, that's an expectation. Um, it's clearly all over the fronts of buildings and all the lobbies with signage specifically colonial signage uh, that's been modified from uh, the CDC uh, guidance documents. And then last, we continue to uh, plan for face-to-face -face instruction. Um, we, have, we are working very diligently to finalize a slew, and I say that word lightly because I don't want to open up and count the number of protocols that have been being worked on for our staff and our families so that we can continue to keep folks safe. Uh, we're in, in the process of assessing our building capacity 
In other words, how many desks can we fit in safely in every classroom to support face-to-face -face learning? Uh, that's going to be our base number to determine where and when we where we bring students back to. At the same time, we're determining our student needs and demands, how many families want to come in face to face. We know initial 40% said they would like face to face, and we unfortunately couldn't meet that demand back. We made that decision back in mid-August. Uh, we're going to continue to look at that 40% uh, to see where they stand as we move forward and get better num stronger numbers as we begin to build the, the schedules out for face to face. We also are working through, the state has afforded um, all employees optional COVID testing. Um, in Colonial, we began round one or phase one, uh, whatever, we started that. Uh, we opened that opportunity up to our custodial staff, our maintenance staff, our nutrition workers, our bus drivers, our, our admin, folks who've been in the buildings quite frequently all summer long for a variety of reasons or who've been in the schools the most since the closeout. Uh, we will begin doing a second round of uh, opening up that opportunity here in the next couple of days. The way we're doing it in Colonial is, is the employees who are, will get an email from John Cooper and the, behavioral, the Director of Behavioral Health saying that you have the opportunity to request a URL. You just need to email a certain contact in HR who will then snatch a URL off of the state website or the, the, date, the, the website or wherever it's stored from the vendor and send that employee the URL and then you link on and do your testing. I tried it out last week. Um, you have to fill out a web portal. You do have to provide some personal identification that needs to be scanned in using the app on your phone. Um, and then you get a overnighted kit tested sent to you that you cannot open in any way, shape or form until you log on to Zoom and you have a technician on the other side who watches you open up the various parts of the test kit. It's a saliva based test, similar. I've never done it, but I've been told it's similar to like an ancestry now thing where you spit into a tube. Um, and then you, they watch you seal it up, shake a vial with something in it, put it back in a, a package, and then you run it down to the UPS store. I think it's like you're wearing like a hot potato. You wanna get it off your desk and get it out there. And then I was out shopping on the weekend and I got this email from the company and I was like, oh my God, I was like afraid to open it. And then in big letters, it tells you what your results are. And so you're like, whoo, all right, I can keep shopping. Um, so that's the, the, in a nutshell what it looked like for myself. I know several other administrators have done it. As of right now, we know 56 employees have requested URLs. We don't know anything other than that they requested the URLs. Um, Student testing is still in the works. We're, we're still waiting for information from DEMA and DPH. Uh, we anticipate hearing something by the end of, beginning of next week with terms of the opportunity for families to test in the community, both those who are remote as well as those who are coming in face to face. And then as Ted, uh, prior to walking in, Ted had mentioned that the DIA is having a, a meeting coming up uh, this week where fall sports are back on the table with a proposal uh, they'll be deciding whether or not they're going to stick with the original proposal to do the three condensed seasons starting in December with fall sports in between winter and spring, or they'll op they're potentially going to open up and return to a modified version of fall during the fall season. And so that's what I know is up for consideration. That was the big information announced from the governor at last Tuesday's press conference. Um, and then I would just say the, the last thing is uh, if you're ever in need for information or someone asks you a question, I have utmost faith that if you go to our website, you know, Gabe Phillips is keeping that thing alive, interactive, entertaining, and very informative. Uh, so I strongly recommend that uh, you continue to, to urge people to check out our website for information. There's a way to contact people on the website as well. It has contact information as well as portals related to technology or just general questions. A little bit longer than a minute, but that's kind of where we are right now at this moment in time. Um, I definitely entertain any questions uh, at the board's pleasure. Questions for Dr. Munzer? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, I might have missed it. Um, the um, when people are going into the school, are they requiring um, appointments? 
no. Uh, they're asking for people to call in advance if they have questions, but there's a, it's a more of a waiting area. They have the lines, they have six feet there's chairs. There's no appointment needed. There, there's no appointment needed. If we haven't, I don't believe we stress that because we know a lot of families do just kind of walk in and sometimes families walk in with multiple kids and there's a lot of stress and angst and we didn't want people to walk up and see that they didn't have an they're waiting in line only to get up there find out they don't have an appointment to be turned away so our schools have been very flexible thus far we've only had three days this is only our third day so we are planning to extend that same time frame into next the same schedule next week as well so we're still kind of working through the ins and outs of that but we haven't had the need to have any appointments yet i didn't get any reports back no. and we did we have been doing some other handouts at the schools for devices and materials. So the, the real purpose of these visits is to get registrations handled. Devices and material deployments, those happened two big, two big events in the last two weeks where William Penn and Gunny Beffer were open to them, to all the pre-K uh, pre through eight families to pick up their materials and devices. William Penn is having a separate one, I think next week uh, after they collect some, some more materials from the students from last year. I know there were some questions that came out from uh, DOE, I guess, reporting about the spring grades, those type of things. How are we addressing them? Spring grades. It's past spring with the, with the shutdown. Well, our grades, we had a grading, uh, We, as part of our remote learning plan, we submitted a proposal for how we were going to be addressing grades, and those were handled, closed out, and we were we wrapped up the school year fine. This year, moving forward, the expectation for remote learning is different than what it was. So that's, there wasn't grading per se during remote learning last year to a point when there was new learning. It was, uh, uh, students were graded on uh, in middle school and the high school. I think they had a length of time to complete the third marking period work that was already out there. And then we had a condensed fourth marking period that was uh, new learning, but I don't believe it was graded to the degree that it was. High school had. High school had grades. So it's, it's hard to answer that question yeah. as, a, as a kind of a yeah. across the board. So what are we doing this year? This year, grades are expected for all all grades. Yes. Okay. And there's an expectation for engagement and completion and participation, uh, both with virtual work as well as with anything that needs to be uploaded uh, into the into the computer, like the documents that will be uploaded on school. Good. Mr. Virtual Academy put down a lot of requirements. Who did? Virtual, virtual Academy. Academy. That's again on the website. There's a Virtual Academy parent link that has a very detailed explanation, broad overview. Each teacher may have a little bit of a different tweak of that. The schedules of the buildings might not be like the samples that are on there, but generally speaking, I think we've pretty much struck a nice balance. It's I like intense. It worked very well for me. <laughs> it, but that was one of the things we heard in our focus groups with parents in June is, is that they wanted a little bit more meat on the bones for the kids to have work. They wanted them to stay engaged. And I think that we put together that that kind of a package. Good. Other questions? I got two. One, with the staff being tested, how often will they be tested or just a one-time thing? So right now the staff are, it is a one-time testing. Um, I haven't heard anything about staff getting second opportunities, although buildings, when students will get the opportunity to be tested, but then schools potentially will have the opportunity for pool testing and random testing as the semesters move on to, uh, based on the rate of infection in the communities that those schools serve. But right now I have not heard anything about a second round of testing for staff. And when they come into the building, are they um, I know some places have questionnaires you got to answer and some people take temperatures. We are we are following the state guidance which says the questionnaires are what is expected of every student before they leave and every parent should be asking those questions and every staff member should be taking the self assessment. And if they display any of the symptoms on the self the self assessment, they are to not come to school. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, this is probably a question for Betsy, but um, we won't know if anyone tests positive, right? We will only know if students test positive. We received communication today that DPH will notify our COVID lead, which is John Cooper. Oh, good. But we will not know if staff tested positive. That is a self-report. And we're making arrangements for 
people with issues regarding immunity? Mm -hmm. they, they've already been, we did a survey of staff in the middle of the summer and staff who indicated that they had concerns or needed accommodations were uh, connected with Debbie Ida, our, our, our specialist in that area. And she, is work, she has worked through with employees those concerns. I have a question. Um, with everything that we're doing with virtual now, the teachers are going to see a lot of new things, uh, especially a lot of these students are now in uh, different facilities that are offering some type of uh, supervised care, things like that. Um, is there any type of process in place where if the teachers are seeing anything concerning, they have the ability to kind of alert somebody to look into that? Each school has their school counselors are working and their nurses. Have you know, they, in the spring, they were the point of contact. If they saw something, they would shoot them an email or contact them to let them know that they may have seen something that's of concern. Um, so there is, a, there is definitely that is available for staff. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay. Uh, next up, I'm gonna turn it over to Pete, who's gonna introduce uh, the 2020 we did run summer program. So we're going to give you a little bit of an update on the summer program. And Pete, you want to kick us off here? Yeah. And before I get to that, you want to one other thing that we did do this 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 year, which was uh, pretty fantastic and powerful, was we had a webinar with a thousand staff members on it to kick off our PD and then wrap up uh, last week. So it was a really nice way to to get everybody to get everybody the message around what to expect and then hopefully inspire them. Uh, for the year through our hopes and dreams. So um, we're, you know, we're, we're really excited about the number of folks that we could pull together, which is something we never have been able to, to do in the past. Good. Um, so every year we have several programs that we offer uh, for, for our kids in the, in the summer. And this summer is no different. Um, the one thing that is a little bit different uh, with this summer is that we had our traditional programs for ESY and our 12 month program. We, we ended up canceling our summer camps because of obviously of having students in person. Um, and so our ESY and 12 month went virtual. Our, we had a Castle Hill and Middle School, Castle Hill Eisenberg and a middle school program um, coordinated by Summer CoLab that was virtual. And then we, and, uh, normally those programs start in October um, with planning. And uh, uh, we decided in only the first or second week in May that we were going to stand up a virtual program for any uh, elementary child that wanted to participate. And uh, the goal of the virtual program was to really to keep kids engaged throughout the summer for those kids that wanted to participate in something academic um, and to make it really fun. And so it just gave our, our staff an incredible latitude in how, what they were going to create and how they're going to create it. Um, and, and charged with the task of pulling this together uh, starting in June. So we, we, we had the program kick off in July. They got identified in June. So like I said, normally we have several months lead up. Um, uh, Jess Hitchens and Matt Folke, um, two of our student advisors, took on that, that challenge and that role. And tonight they're here to talk about um, the success of the program. So I'll let them take it away. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jessica Hitchens. I'm currently a student advisor at Gunning Bedford Middle School. Matt Folke and I were the coordinators of the We Read and We Count for Fun summer program this year. This purpose of our program was to continue to provide access to high quality education to all of our students within Colonial throughout the summer months by offering a comprehensive academic program in both reading and math in a safe nurturing environment in order to build new relationships as well as maintain previous relationships between staff, students, families, and stakeholders during these unprecedented times in virtual learning. And we will begin our presentation tonight with a preview of the trailer that curriculum and instruction created prior to the students uh, selecting their novels for our program this summer.
All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Folke. I am currently a student advisor at McCullough Middle School. And as Jess mentioned, we had the privilege of helping uh, coordinate the uh, We Read, We Count summer program. The program ran, just to give you a little bit of logistics and background, uh, the program ran from July 6th to August 6th. Uh, it consisted of a 45 minute, uh, we had about 10 teachers and about 15 to 20 students per class. Um, and it was about a 45 minute Zoom a day with some extension activities as well. Uh, and one of the things we talked about a lot throughout the program was uh, we gave the kids reading choice. So as you saw in the trailer, there were many, the students got to pick a grade level appropriate text. Uh, we had first and second grade text, grade, grade level appropriate, and then three through five. Um, and we created a virtual bookshelf with our curriculum staff, which did a great, excellent job. And you'll, we'll give them a shout out later on in the presentation. Um, we held a materials distribution at Southern. We had, a, we had two locations. We held one at Southern and then a North uh, distribution at Pleasantville. And we're proud to say that we had over 200 students engaged in this program. So one of the things we talked about a lot throughout our summer, summer meetings, we were amazed because we were able to put um, books in over 200 kids' hands throughout the summer. So they were reading texts, they were engaged, um, and not only uh, reading, they were also engaged in math. Our elementary kids, um, they, did a, they got the opportunity to dive into a calendar, a daily calendar with a math activity, which we'll explain a little bit further in the presentation. And also, um, the three, three to five grades got a chance to do three-act math. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but we will have an opportunity later in the presentation to talk a little bit more about that in depth. Okay, thank you, Matt. So Matt and I would first like to thank the curriculum and instruction work group that laid the foundation for us and our staff when creating, planning, and sharing pre-made lesson plans for our teachers to use throughout the five weeks of our program. Our curriculum and instruction work group was the backbone of our program. And once again, thank you to our amazing work group members and you can see them right there on your screen. Moving into curriculum and instruction, we're gonna begin with the We Read portion of our program. So this summer program allowed curriculum and instruction to be inventive with an approach that provided a break for the students from screen time as they have received a lot of both in the spring and currently now. So we wanted to provide them with that break from screen time. So we were able to actually physically get novels into the kids' hands, as Matt had mentioned earlier. This was a priority for our, for our work group, as many students had not been able to do so since March. They were able to interact virtually, but they weren't actually having materials in their hands. So that was a huge focus of our program this summer. The students are now, were now afforded the opportunity to access multiple texts that they could read independently or with their group. Providing our students with a choice in their literature, again, as Matt had said, was a focus point for our group. Given that the program was voluntary, both the work group and research suggested that participation would increase when students are given the choice in what they would like to read. And the high number of student participation ref reflected this, that and that this was the best practice and contributed to the success of our program. We actually had 196 students attend our program. Students were provided with diverse texts connected to read to recent events, and they were provided in the form of graphic novels and fictional texts. They were provided for all grade levels, grades one through two receiving three mini series books and grades three through five received two chapter books per child. All right, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our math program. Um, so as I said before, grades three through five engaged in three act math. Basically three act math is, there's three different acts. The first act is to kind of, the purpose is to engage the kids, to kind of hook the kids with a really engaging type video. Sometimes it's funny, um, it just really engages them with a real life math problem. Act two um, is information and solution seeking. So the students are looking at um, just different solutions and how they can figure out a problem. There's not one way to do things. There's multiple ways to do things. And we really focused on that. Our teachers really had the kids focus on that. And then obviously act three was solution discussion. And then there was a reveal with the answer to the problem. But the focus was on not one way to do things. There's multiple ways um, to do different problems. Um, and using three act math provide our students with the opportunity to add engagement and math understanding. And students wonder, so what will happen next? 
It also provided opportunities to talk about mathematics and have, them have the students a chance to reflect on what they were doing. <clears throat> students were also able to build new knowledge from prior knowledge and multiple solutions were discussed in a collaborative format. So I wanted to give a little shout out to our summer program staff. Um, we had about 10 teachers work with us this summer and they did an awesome job. Um, one of the things Jess and I talked about throughout the summer was the teachers were all in. Um, they, they went above and beyond. Uh, they were given a curriculum to work with, but they thought outside the box. Um, they just, they, they did new innovative things. They added uh, responsive classroom strategies to really build that classroom culture, even in a virtual setting, which was amazing to see. Jess and I had weekly check-ins with the teachers and we were able to see some awesome things um, in those classrooms. They did modeling. Um, they modeled using a whiteboard like they would in a classroom. Um, it was really good. Uh, lots of read alouds and partner reading. Um, they also used the Zoom breakout room feature, which was amazing to see um, for small group discussion collaboration. Um, they did lots of hands-on activities, having the kids get up and find measuring things in their house, counting different, how many Cheerios are in a different box, just all kinds of things, thinking outside the box. Um, so we were really, really fortunate to work with such an awesome group of teachers. So we definitely wanted to give them a huge, um, a huge shout out. So at this point, I want to um, turn it over to uh, Ms. Bree Williams, she is a kindergarten teacher at William, Wilmington Manor Elementary School, uh, and she taught grades one and two for our summer program. She did an excellent job, and uh, we wanted to give her an opportunity to really talk about, um, from a teacher's perspective, how um, her classroom went this summer. Thank you, Matt. Um, as Matt said, I am a dual certified kindergarten teacher. I have been teaching for 22 years, and I am at Wilmington Manor Elementary School. This summer, I taught the rising first and second graders using the Pete the Cat series novels that were picked from the district. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you all this evening. At first, when I joined this program, I was um, initially nervous, thinking that it would be difficult to build a community with students I had never met before. But I was wrong, and I'm happy to say that it can work. By using Zoom and responsive classroom strategies, we were able to build a very strong community within days. By day four, some of the students would say, Mrs. Williams, I can't believe I didn't know you before this experience. And I felt the same way. Our community was strong and it happened really quickly. Um, our curriculum and instruction team is incredible, as you all know. They went above and beyond to plan amazing lessons for us as educators to use in the classroom. By using these novels, we were able to uh, bring reading to life for these kids. But we had the flexibility of being able to also um, use our own tricks and tips and techniques from our own toolboxes to enhance the lessons. For example, one of the novels that novels that my class focused on was Pete the Cat and the Cool Caterpillar. And at our house at the Williams residence, we raise monarchs. We are actually a monarch sanctuary. And none of the students in my class had ever seen um, a monarch egg or a caterpillar in real life. The story brought the metamorphosis of a monarch to life. And I was able to do that with my students over the screen. And it was an amazing experience. Not only did the students learn, but the teachers also grew from this experience. Using the guidance of Matt and Jess, we were able to challenge ourselves and to grow as educators. Matt and Jess came into our classrooms weekly to just check things out and see how things were going. And from that experience, they provided feedback to us. That feedback was crucial for us to grow. I really hope that this program continues into the future it was sincerely a pleasure to be able to take part in it. I'm happy to say that I'm still close to the students that I taught this summer, and I still have correspondence with their parents. I really think that it was a very positive part for the power of we. Thank you. Thank you, Bree. We appreciate that. Now, um, as Bree stated, we're going to turn it over to, uh, we had a a parent and a, and a student um, from actually from Bree's class, we had them share. So you get a little bit of a perspective from a parent and a student in the We Read 
We Count summer program. So check this video out. Good morning. Good morning, and I'm Patricia Edwards and my son Elijah. And we're here to say thank you for the amazing summer remote learning program. And we're really happy to be part of it. Um, I really, as a parent, I, I think that Mr. Williams did an awesome job engaging the kids with their activities and the book selection. And, well, Elijah, what was your favorite book? Peter the Dead Comes Camping. Why? this time, we would like to take a moment for you to read through some of the parent feedback that we collected from the surveys that we sent out at the end of our program. Again, these are just a few. We, re we received several from our parents and all which was positive feedback, stating that their children really enjoyed our program. They felt a sense of accomplishment, a sense of belonging, and they were able to interact with students their age, um, which is something that a lot of kids were missing during these summer months due to COVID-19. And again, we would like to thank Dr. Lida, Patty Shelton, Curriculum and Instruction, our teachers and families who all played pivotal roles in ensuring that our program was successful. They all embodied the power of we. And if anything else, they gave us a positive outlook for this school year because we know it can be done, it has been done, and Colonial will continue to do so throughout the, the next six weeks. So thank you everyone for your time. And if you have any questions, Matt and I are open to answering them. Have any questions for the program team. Mr. Yee? No, sir. Mr. Handy? No. Mr. Kuchu? Is this program still continuing throughout the school year or is it just was just for the summer? So this program was just for the summer. We're hoping that we have the opportunity to do it again next summer. A lot of our parents in the survey feedback actually said that they wish that it would have went longer than five weeks. So we're hoping that we're able to have this opportunity again next summer. Kennedy? Yeah, I love the positive statements there from the parents. Thank you very much. We appreciate your efforts. And uh, again, thank you very much for doing Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next item, um, I would ask uh, the board to turn your attention to the uh, agenda in your packet. I, you have in there the Colonial School District Policy Number 106, Student Participation and Extracurricular Activities. Um, the reason I bring that forward is, is that it, it pertains to the current situation, the pending situation with fall sports. Um, if athletes are to uh, return to the playing field, Per the board policy, there are certain requirements with respect to eligibility that the district places on top of our student athletes above and beyond the DEA requirements. Um, given our situation with COVID, uh, as we did in the spring, there was, a, there was an emergency waiver of that feature, but we obviously didn't have to do it because kids didn't participate. But we're now in a situation where if there's a possibility of students participating in fall sports, um, we need the boards, uh, I'd like to ask the board to waive this, their eligibility policy, which is uh, items three through seven in the policy. This is not waiving DIA, obviously we're bound by that, but this is the boards above and beyond GPA average for high school students to participate. At least give us time to get our feet on the ground and move forward before we reinstitute this policy. We'll hear a motion. A motion, Mr. President, to waive the requirements set forth in policy number 106, items three to seven. 
so that students may participate in DIAA fall sports. Such waiver shall remain in effect until, until otherwise determined. So here's second. Second. The move by Mr. McGee, second by Mr. Handy to approve the waiver as requested by the administration. Any questions? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed, no. Motion is carried. Thank you. Budget grades report. Ms. Thompson. Good evening once again, Colonial Board members and Colonial Nation. Um, we are looking first tonight at the variance report for uh, the month ending July 31st. So it's our first look at uh, FY21. Uh, this was reviewed by our finance committee on September 1st. We have a virtual meeting. Um, we've got 8.3% of the fiscal year has gone by. We've gotten about half of our expected annual revenue, uh, most of that coming from state funding. Year to date, our expenditures are at 9.7% and uh, just under 10 and a quarter, including conferences. <clears throat> Uh, some additional details that were discussed at the meeting. Um, we do have just under $19,000 worth of credit card transactions uh, took place in July. Um, we did also talk about the use of the contingency budget. Um, this has been a staple of the budget for as long as I've been here. And normally it is withheld as, you know, in the event that something completely unforeseen comes up. We obviously used that last year uh, with, with the pandemic situation and some of the spending that we had there. Um, I did discuss with the committee the need to continue using that budget um, until our CARES Act, spend, CARES Act uh, grant funds are received. So we're going to basically put, um, put our expenses on that budget. <clears throat> Once the CARES Act money comes in, we will move all the appropriate funds over there. Um, I do still have the contingency budget set up in case we have any expenses that exceed what we received for CARES Act. Um, but I also discussed with the committee, uh, they, they expressed a desire to have a separate report on that CARES Act spending. So um, I will begin to report that out once those grant funds have been received and we have expenditures against them. Um, and obviously that'll be presented to the board as well. Um, and as I said, you know, um, we did meet and they recommended approval to the board of the budget variance report. Um, are there any questions? Any questions for Ms. Falcon? Uh, Ms. Falcon, separate from the, you know, the report itself, you guys still have an open slot on the committee now, is that right? That is correct, yes. Can you guys, uh, do you guys have the ability, can you put in a request to have them advertise that so that we can try to fill that? Um, I can certainly talk to Mr. Phillips about pushing that on social media. I know it has been a part of um, the financial section of the website for, you know, we kind of have a standing invitation to participate in that committee, um, but I can absolutely talk with, uh, with Gabe about putting it in part of our communications and getting it publicized. Cool. Thank you. Absolutely. Other questions? Do I hear a motion to approve the monthly budget variance report? Motion. Been moved by, by Mr. P2 to, <clears throat> to approve the month, monthly budget variance report and seconded by Mr. McGee. Questions? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. <coughs> Motion is carried. Studio Jade Facilities Needs Assessment. Uh, so at this point in time, um, we're bringing uh, Ted Lambert into the presentation, as well as uh, Pam Babuka, who is um, a member of the, actually she was the, the um, spearheaded the effort for our facility needs assessment that was done by Studio J. Um, and Babuka is joining us now, and I believe she is going to be um, sharing her screen and going through the presentation and walking you through the high-level overview of the the needs assessment that we've um, undertaken in the last couple of months. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Can you all hear me? Now, yes. Now, yes. yes. All right. Awesome. 
Okay, my name is Pamela Babuka. I am a partner of Studio Jade, and it is a real pleasure to be here with you this evening. I'd like to give you a quick recap of the findings and the discoveries from the facilities condition assessment that we conducted earlier this year. The items that um, I will quickly review uh, are the assessment scope and parameters. Uh, an example of a building level detailed report our overall observation and findings, and then leave it open for any questions and answers. In total, we assessed 17 of your district buildings, which represents approximately 1.6 million square feet. We went through a process where project standards and district initiatives were identified, and we used those as our baseline, as our ruler in which we assessed all of the buildings. The facilities team and your specialist were part of our assessment and we conducted interviews with them to gain a better understanding of known facility conditions um, issues. And that uh, significantly supplemented our understanding of, of known issues. And then with all that in hand, we went, in, we went ahead and conducted our on-site investigations with our professional architects engineers. Our scope, Again, this was a deferred maintenance assessment. So we were evaluating over the next 10 years, the needs for your major building systems and components. We were, we were evaluating their existing conditions and then identifying what items you need to be projecting or looking as a look ahead between years now and the next 10 years in order to maintain good um, standard operations. We then took any of those corrective actions that were identified and developed regionalized construction cost estimates. And we applied a soft cost model to them that, were, um, that was defined with the school district. Just for you to have a sense of what that represents, here is a listing of all the different, what we would consider major building systems that were evaluated in the process. And under, obviously, each one of these is an, a more extensive list of um, building systems and components that sit below that. Each line item, so every time we evaluate a particular component, we identified the when, when it would be recommended that this corrective action be performed. If something was identified as a priority one, it suggested that it needed to be done immediately and we identify as a life safety item. Priority two is years one to two. Priority three is medium was three to five years. And then priority four is low hanging six to 10 years. A report that looks um, just like this was developed for each of the buildings that we assessed. You will see where item number one is. Everything was organized using what is called uniformat, but it was organized by the system name. Um, where number two is, is you can see where we tagged pieces of information. So it was everything was prioritized and there's other fields of data that were identified. Ultimately, number three, we identified a construction cost that then had the soft cost um, um, accrued into that. And then for each of the systems had a subtotal that was identified in each report. So a, a report of this nature at this level of detail um, was provided in your packet for each building that we assessed. Ultimately, these detailed reports rolled up to a district-wide summary report. And this is an example of that. We have, since the work um, was assessed and identified earlier this year, we added a column, item number two, where we reviewed all the corrective actions and work that has been completed by Ted and his group and other outside um, contracts. And that item was identified. So now you have a means to track work that was originally projected as capital improvements, but has been completed as well. Everything else uh, that is still remaining still is listed in the party one through fours. And then you have um, everything obviously rolls up to a comprehensive district wide number. Just for your reference, uh, we did summarize the work complete that has been done since earlier this year. Some of it might have initiated during the assessment process, but what is done is listed. Um, and in total from projected uh, 
improvement dollars, not necessarily from actuals, was a $3.1 million capital improvements. Overall, to gain an understanding of how the district and the buildings that we assessed um, evaluated, um, there was just a very small, less than 1% actually, of work that is identified as priority one. And um, in many cases, these items are related to, for example, handrails that are required by code that may not exist now, but are required. Or if there is um, more common, is where there is an exit sign that may be required or that is not operational right now and needed to be repaired or, or replaced. So those items were identified and provided to um, Ted for, for them to address. Um, what is to be noted is your biggest bucket is the high priority, which is the $98 million. And again, this is over 10 years. But that priority two represents recommended deferred maintenance work to be completed within the next one to two years. Priority three is an equally significant but bucket of money with $92 million. And so collectively, across, uh, across the total needs, 79% of your improvement needs um, all need to be or are recommended to be addressed within the next five years. So all, this is not uncommon. This is something that happens. It's very difficult to get money focused and the, the right amount of money focused to address deferred maintenance needs. Um, so you are in, a, in a, a common place, but it is something that's gonna require focused attention in order to be able to make significant change. Overall, we like to provide um, kind of a glimpse at where your greatest needs are. We looked at those items that were simply in years one through five. And out of all of those items, roofing systems are where the greatest costs um, and needs surfaced. Second to that was HVA systems, and third is electrical. This is not uncommon. What we also recognize, however, too, is that the more active your preventive maintenance program is and your consistent funding of deferred maintenance is how these numbers will significantly change. But that is where it stands as of our assessment um, earlier this year. Uh, there are, are several other documents that we provided in the packet that was submitted for your review, and we just wanted to make sure you knew that they're available for you. Um, a lot of times people ask, what are those priority ones, and can you provide an overview of the work complete? Both of those were included in there, as well as a district-wide summary report. And that concludes the summary of your assessment. I'm open for any questions. Go back three pages, please. I, I, well, go forward one, I'm sorry. Okay, Page sorry. <laughs> there you go. All right, give us a minute or two so we can take a look at this. So for some reason or other, we don't have the package in our, in our, uh, in our information. So I'm just kind of trying to take a look at this here real quick. What type of items did you find underneath of fire protection? So fire protection is gonna be items such as sprinklers um, and other things in many cases that are related to code related improvements. Um, and we have the ability through the database that we generated to issue a detailed report that shows all things that fell under that fire protection category. Where are we at, what the, just if you, if you have, because you have the report in front of you, I'm not sure how quickly you can get to it or not. Where are, we with the, where are we with not being under code for fire protection? Um, I do not actually have access to that. I'm off site right now, so I don't have the report in front of me, but um, I do have the ability to issue that to you this evening once we go offline and I can run the report and show that to you. I'm just trying to be sensitive to your time. Uh, that, that would be helpful because I find it very hard to believe that if we have a code violation from a fire protection system, but we've got kids in the school. That, uh, that one, uh, um, now, keep in mind that this is not just about something that's active. We are projecting investment in systems that's not just deferred, but it's asset renewal. So that means the life of an existing system based off of not just when it's installed, but when it should be replaced based on recommended improvements and the life cycle of a particular asset when it's recommended for replacement. So it doesn't mean it's failing right now. 
This is about projecting dollars you need to maintain and for those systems to be updated over the life of the asset. Now, what falls into this fire protection? Is it all the wet systems? Is it all the uh, uh, evacuation equipment, those, those type of things? What all yes. falls into that? Yes. Now, one of your other items that you had on there, and I don't see it broken out, is um, it might fall underneath of your site improvements, is the athletic facilities, those type of things. Where does that fall? Yes, so um, anything related to that, and it, we do have subsets within a, um, a, the deeper data sets that would fall under site improvements. Okay, I'd like to see that broken out a little bit more in fine detail. Because to me, site improvements have to do with the gra well, with grounds, but that's part of it but also would have to do with parking lots, sidewalks, those type of things. Absolutely, it includes all of those things. Anything that's related to pedestrian or vehicular access for students and um, visitors on campus. Right, it doesn't show me anything to do with athletic facilities and whatnot that are at our middle schools and at our high school. Well, it's not broken down here and it's, and it's cumulative, but they were also assessed. But is that in, that, is that in the breakdown that, that we haven't seen yet? Yes, so that I, we can issue you a report that shows everything that falls under site improvements. Well, but is that, I understand that this document that you provided about is about a four inch thick binder. Is that, is that um, summary of those breakdowns available in that, in that binder already or is that another report that you have to run? So for at a school by right now, the binder, the binder is set up so that you can look at the detailed report by school. If you want to see something that's specific to site improvements only, I can run the report so that you only see site improvements across all district schools. But the content of the data is sitting in the report binders that are provided by school at this time. Okay, well, I want to take a look through all this and find out what reports we need because right off the top of my head, I can see that, that one. I'd like to see what the fire, the fire protection is, uh, you know, at the beginning. Um, Roofing systems is pretty self-explanatory. Conveying, is, I'm assuming, is elevators. That's correct. We don't have very many elevators throughout the district because we only have uh, two or three multiple story uh, buildings. So that should be a small ticket. And or it could be lifts. It could potentially be lifts as well. If there's an area that's not accessible, that's required to be accessible, that could be there as well. Such as stages and correct. some of the those type of things? Yes, sir. Okay. And then the electrical system, I want to see more of a breakdown on that. I mean, if we have anything that's eminent there that we have to deal with, I'd like to see that. What falls, underneath, what falls underneath your selective demolition? So um, selective demolition is going to have um, elements such as um, it, um, if you have any um, asbestos or any type of material that needs to be removed, uh, such as of that nature, but selective demolition can also be um, associated to um, on your site. Like for example, if there is something that needs to be removed or that was um, a, a civil related item, because we also did assess your site systems, your civil, that would also be under se selective demolition. But more often than not, that percentage is associated to um, suspect materials. Well, I think, in years past, we went through an extensive HVAC capital improvement plan across the whole district. And I would, would hope that most of that uh, questionable material should have, been, should have been handled as part of those, those projects. I don't have the, the number in front of me, the value of that, uh, that program, but it was rather large. So I would have, would have hoped that most of our uh, materials would have been dealt with in there. Now, with that being said, there may be some floors that we have, you know, uh, in some of the older schools that have that adhesive, those type of things that may be part of that, as well as some, some piles and those type of things. But I would think most of our insulation, unless it's buried in drywall or buried in walls, whether it be masonry or anything like that, should have, should have been handled. So uh, I'd like to see, see that a little bit more detailed as well. Can do. All right, so right now I have fire protection side improvements, um, electrical and selective materials. Select I would think most of our roofs should also have been handled with that as well, as those roof replacements have been on there. So that's 
So this was a non-destructive kind of, there's, there was no, nothing that was intrusive. So anything that would have been selective demolition would be something that would have been visually um, observed. So more often than not, this in many cases circles back to um, um, nine by nine tile or uh, things of that nature. Okay, well, that's, that's what I brought up about the flooring and, and, and the adhesive. So we go from there. So yeah, yeah, it's gonna be, if we can get those couple of summaries, or the ones that I can see right now from my perspective, I'd love to see this uh, binder so I can spend some time and go through it because, Thank you. you know, a couple of them are kind of disturbing to me sitting here right now looking at it with the fire protection sticking out number one. That's definitely a life safety issue. Yes, and again, that doesn't mean that the systems aren't operational right now. This is projecting what you should be considering for capital improvement needs over the next 10 years. Well, but I, I guess my question is, is if they're not failing, why are they capital needs assessment? Because they most typically would be handled during any renovation projects or any other projects that we would do if the fire system is, is affected with, with those projects. So when we, when we perform an assessment, we identify time frame and we don't, we look at the condition of the asset based off of its existing conditions. And we don't take into consideration if there is a up couple, upcoming capital improvement for that project. We base it off of it, the condition of it the day that we're in the field. And then we're evaluating it based off of benchmarks and industry standards for the anticipated life of that particular component. Many components have only a 15 year life cycle. And if that particular asset's been in play for already 10 years, it's gonna fall within recommended replacement within five. Now, you may be able to maintain it and keep it for eight or nine more years, but part of this is about project providing you information for how to best plan for your capital improvement needs in the in the look ahead. I'm, I'm not aware of any special fire systems that we have. I think everything that we have is all wet systems. We don't have, and I know I'm gonna say Halon because I'm old school on that. We don't have any protection systems like that. We're all wet. But the smoke detectors require replacement after 10 years. Okay. So they're all cycling, well, 14 buildings or more are cycling. That's, that's part of that. That would okay. probably explain most of that. Okay. Yeah, when we take a look at that, we'll see what those specific items are that you have in there. Excellent. HVA, HVAC systems, that's really disturbing on me because, like, again, we, we spent all that money in less than 10 years that we went through that whole program. Well, that would have been, I think the referendum was in 2005, so that was 15 years ago already, and some of those systems have already failed and had to be replaced, so. Okay. Mm -hmm. What about the train upgrade? The train upgrade we... Going um, most of that was actually BAS work and some other efficiency items. There wasn't any actual boiler or chiller replacements that were okay. done as part of that ESCO. So you're saying that part of that HVA systems is chiller replacements and boilers, those type of things? Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's all systems. So that could be any component. That could be down to unit ventilators that are individual units, or it could be a systemic did you take a look at it to where there's any comparison between going from chilled water systems back to uh, DX type units? So the assessment is about evaluating and identifying what a current system is. And in the recommendation, it, it has the opportunity to identify it with potentially um, a, more, um, a more improved system. We don't design it and push it out to what that will be, but we do include the pricing opportunity for something that is more efficient. All right, I'll be interested to see the report. We'll make sure you receive a full copy of the binder. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, you know, I'm caught by surprise. Earn your leisure reading tag. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking at it and I don't see anything. And Jeff just told me, he says, it's about a four inch binder. And I said, ooh, okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> that gets to a 20 page. Yeah, well, that's, that's what I'm saying. I, was, I just wanted to take a look at it. We've got some down. We've got some summaries of each section. That's a good place to start. Then we're going to dig deeper from there. Mary Beth, I just texted her to make sure that the, the summary stuff that she's referencing that was submitted to us, it's not the four-inch binder. We'll send to you all uh, electronically. But then we'll work on getting the 
other information is the larger yeah. scope of work. If we see that, then we might be able to dig a little bit deeper. Into some specific does areas. any other board member want to receive a full binder? We can make sure that that happens. Yeah, I like I like going down a rabbit hole. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Couple, couple of us have some experience in this. Kind of thing. <laughs> That's why I'm asking some of the pointed questions. Thank you, Pam. So, Pam right, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Very welcome. And I, I believe I'm on the next agenda item as well. Yep. So, um, Pam, we're just going to roll right into the next presentation, which is um, the basically an overview of this year's uh, CN request for the New Leaf School that we plan to submit. Uh, later this month to the Department of Education. So, Pam, back over to you. Okay, great. Um, I, I'm not sure if you have a copy of this in front of you or not, but ultimately okay. this is the updated and revised Certificate of Necessity submission for the LEAP School. There are a couple of things. I know that you had reviewed this um, previously, um, but there's some things I would like to highlight for you. Um, and let me just go ahead and go page width. So um, there's a lot of terminology that you will see in here, similar to what you just saw, because we also performed a detailed facilities condition assessment to identify the needs over the next 10 years mm -hmm. for leach as well. Um, that was one part. The second piece to that was we also identified uh, programmatically what those needs are, recognizing that the students at leach have some other space and add, uh, space related needs to help them really be an environment that suits how and the challenges that they have for learning. Ultimately, the findings uh, that were presented previously is the evaluation of the existing space that Leach School um, um, contains and is overall, when you look at these systems, was rated as being fair to poor condition in their existing state. And that was part of the um, recommendation when looking at whether to renovate or build new. This was part of the benchmark for that decision, I, I believe, that the district had used previously. Um, I want to um, flip you to, um, there's a lot of detail that sits behind here, but I'd like to go to page 14. Um, the outcome ultimately um, of this was a new 65,000 square foot school. And let me scroll down here to the bottom. The 65,000 square feet was based off of um, a revision of the program that we went through a very detailed pro programmatic review of existing space versus programs that need to be presented, the types of spaces with the staff. And that is how we arrived at that, that value. On this lower section, line B, the new construction cost per square foot, we have updated this from what is line C in the table above because of the um, every year BDOE um, adjusts most of the time, their cost per square foot for replacement of new schools. And so that increased from the 422.80 to the 448.54 per square foot, which gave us a base number of the 29.1. Um, with that, there was an allowance that was recommended based off of the needs of the students to provide these enhanced ADA bathrooms that have um, lots of supplemental equipment and support devices um, as a separate allowance, as a special need above and beyond, um, which put it to the 29.35. That square footage cost is built off the prevailing wage? Um, yes, it is, but, and that is also defined by DDOE specifically. So, I mean, we're not actually allowed to use anything else but what they provide. However, um, typically, DDOE offers three, three rates, an elementary, a middle, and a high school rate, and, and special schools are allowed to use the high school rate for construction. I understand that, but that, in your opinion, is that $448 per square foot calculated using a prevailing wage rate yes sir okay if it was not prevailing wage what do you think what, what would be your estimate that that cost would be reduced per square foot mm. um i 
I don't actually know that number. It I would have to look to one of my um, peers who would be able to give you that information. It would be a complete guess for me. So I, I can come back to you to tell you what that would be, but that's not something that I'm comfortable with. I'd like with. to have that because in years past, that, that percentage, the studies have been done on it, it's, it's about 35 to 40%. Okay. Um, I may have changed by now, but I'm just, because that was a hot topic five or six years ago, probably, maybe a little bit longer. Yeah. Okay, noted. Um, in this document, uh, the next section, this, this section was expanded because when the report, the draft report was originally complete, there was a proposal um, and a section in here that was very generic, a, about proposing a new site and that was under consideration still by the school district. So we have reviewed the information that of the process that you went through with PLUS, we have added this into DDOE's recommended um, documentation um, in this presentation. So all of that information, the due diligence that you've already completed is included in here as well as all the um, major supplements uh, are included as attachments, Appendix C, D, and E um, for the submission to the DDOE process. Just as, yes. Um, again, this is the site. Uh, we've included this document as a point of reference for them, which also uh, for, for your review, because there will be a meeting um, with the DDOE team for them to understand and sign off on this. And ultimately what we're seeking is funding both for the land as well as for the new construction. All right, on the next page. Um, one of the things uh, that we have noticed over the last couple of years is we have had to provide um, a much stronger um, documentation uh, requesting and identifying site development costs and the justifications for them. So we, we started this when we initiated the process in 2018, but this has been updated. Uh, so the extraordinary site development costs are broken down in your packet. Um, we have gone through several um, variations and rounds of this, reevaluated the total dollars, but, and we already had kind of a preliminary quote unquote blessing, so to speak, from DDOE on how we've documented this. We believe that um, in this particular case, these are real dollars and many cases haven't been identified in the past and you have then acquired the need to spend that money to make the site applicable and usable um, without getting the funding. So we have been putting this in at a much more detailed level. Uh, one of the things that was added um, is item L, site sound abatement, where we are made a recommendation based off of the site location. There potentially be a berm that's added or along Route 1 to provide a little bit more um, sound continuation there. Um, in total, the dollars that we are requesting for these site conditions is $2.9 million. Again, this becomes something that's part of the federal request for the development of the site. For, um, for Leach School. You'll also see under section H and I, um, it's not just about providing typical playgrounds. This is about extraordinary costs that go above and beyond. And so there are also unique needs for this student population and that's included as well. And lastly, when you look at the dollars, uh, the total dollars that would be requested uh, based off of the new school and the land because they are submitted in forms to DDOE as two completely separate submissions. The land acquisition, um, there is the due diligence reimbursement. There was a $37,000 line item for um, a geotechnical report, which you're required to issue as part of your PLUS process, but you get to ask for it back in this process. The purchase of the land specifically as it was in the plus documentation and then in the blue are the line items you see the extraordinary site cost at the 2.9 and then the breakout of the new school design uh, in 2022 and then the construction dollars in 2023 the line items in 2023 are escalated which is 
you have um, a slight adjustment up in the total project cost of 3.59. Are there any questions? Your, your design line that you have there for 1.9 million, does that include contract administration as well or is that just flat design? Yes, that would be the design fees. But not contract administration while the project is, is uh, going Correct. On. That filled into the construction cost. Uh, the design line item is comprehensive. It is it is the allowance. It is the total design fees, and then that has end up being split out over the life of the project. We split those two things out specifically. So the construction dollars are literally for the construction of the building and design, taking it from concept through CA is all online, all included in design. You just told me that CA was not included in the design. It was all design. It, now you're saying it is in the design number. Design is inclusive of the dollars associated to A&E services, which takes it from the beginning to the end. Sorry for miscommunicating. Okay. So Ted, you're looking for if we had like a construction management company um, that would sort of come in and, and work alongside of us as like a project management company, correct? Correct, and then the, the architects of design basically would also be as a construction administration type thing too to work along with that team through the end of the project. Absolutely. Right. Your, your, CM, your CM will run the project, but the, the architectural firm and the engineering firm would be assisting that team. Correct. So I think Pam, is that is the is the CM included in that in that one point nine million? I think is what he's what he's asking. No, no. The CM would be included in your construction costs. Correct. The CA, construction administration, okay. the time for the architectural and engineers to be on site and to be part of answering questions and doing ASIs and all those other things, the actual on site piece of it, that is all in inclusive. That includes all your submittal processing, all your RFIs, all those kinds Absolutely. of Absolutely. Correct. So at this point, we per code or reg, whatever it is, we need the board's approval. Uh, we've already, even though we voted on this CN request two summers ago, yep. yeah. um, we have since found land and done more due diligence to secure that land and get further along in the plus process than we've ever gotten for the five parcels that we've looked at. Um, so this is a, a near record, but we would need the, the board's approval to submit this, to throw it in the hopper uh, for the CNs uh, this season or this cycle. Right. Do I hear a motion? Motion made. Do I hear a second? Second. Been moved by Ms. Kennedy, second by Mr. McGee to proceed with their certificate of need process using this budget. Questions? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Hold on one second. Mr. McGee? Yes. Impact study, traffic, and uh, well, the chemical plants down that way. Should all be part of the design effort, I would think. Environmental was done by, we did an environmental now, Formosa study. Formosa closed, right? Hmm? Formosa is closed. Yeah. Okay. okay. I don't know what's the status of the traffic study, Ted. I know that that was in the works or soon to be. Where were we with that one? Yeah, the, the traffic study takes approximately three months to complete. Um, they planned on having it complete at the end of September. Um, uh, but that's so they, they weren't able to um, you know, push that forward any faster based on all the data that they have to collect. So uh, right now we don't have the, the traffic impact study um, at hand. So but that three hundred that three hundred thousand that three hundred thousand dollars that was in that budget is an estimate of what we think is going to take to go to make the, the intersection improvements here. Mm -hmm. is, yes. that be, is that going to be off the old Route 13 or is that going to be off 72? It's going to be off the old Route 13. Route 13. It's going to come off of 13, the old 13. Okay, so traffic impact. Impact. That's, that's a heck of a lot less than what it used to be. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. All right. 
Any other questions? Again, hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion is carried. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next order of business we have is items removed from the consent agenda. We had none. Items deleted from the agenda. We had none. Public comment. We have one. The individual online. There he is. Just, yeah, just gave him the ability to talk. There you go. Thank you. Uh, you, right. have yeah, can you, you have a three minute time limit. All right. Thank you. Hi, this is Sakti Vail. I'm uh, a creator of a game called Numbers B. And uh, we've talked to, I think, earlier on, uh, you know, we were uh, Matthew Folk and uh, Crystal Lankur was there. Uh, we've been running this in Delaware for about. Uh, since 2003, and we have run 16 uh, Delaware Numbers B tournaments out of uh, Red Clay School District. Christina and uh, Brandywine have participated in it. Delaware State University has co-sponsored it. And really lately, we have come up with, uh, you know, due to the COVID-19, uh, there's got to be an, uh, you know, in-person in tournaments are kind of, a, uh, you know, verboten these days. So we've, you know, we've come up with a mobile app in which the children can play it from their homes or schools or wherever they happen to be. So this Number Royale is a unique live streaming game show app with a host where the students can compete and solve number puzzles. And it improves numeracy across you know, language, age, cultural, and social divides. And we have uh, had students or about 1200 students in Christina School District have gone through this program a few years ago in a study and we found that for every 100 minutes of gameplay, the DCAS testing scores improved by 40%. That's 40% uh, of their annual increase was achieved you know, with a, within about 100 minutes of gameplay. So we believe that this game could be very beneficial to students and we are getting ready to start the tournaments and we would like to invite uh, Colonial School District students uh, to participate in this upcoming tournament. The app name is Number Royale. You can contact me, uh, you know, my, I have provided my email address and I would appreciate it if uh, you can share it, uh, the information with anybody, uh, with people who are, would be appropriate. I'll uh, also, you know, contact uh, Ms. Lankur and, uh, you know, share the information. So any, any questions, feel free to give me a call. Thank you. I appreciate uh, this time and uh, wishing you all a nice evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Any other items by the board? Just one. Okay. Um, there's a class action shoot with uh, Joel. There's not any cost to the districts right now. Um, trying to figure out if we want to be part of the litigation. Uh, if we don't, that's fine. If we do and they win, we may get some money out of it. And if we lose, then we, we don't get anything. That's a, that's an item we should undertake an executive session right. on these legal issues. Mm -hmm. right. We can either go back into executive session for a couple of minutes after we adjourn this meeting, we go from there if everybody's okay with doing that. All right. All right. Any other items from board members? Not hearing none, do I hear a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. So here, second. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. <coughs> we are adjourned. Just a couple minutes. In.